So what are we going to be looking at today then, Tim? Uh, malleable encryption. Problem is it's not you, the encryptor, that can change it, but it's actually anyone, including the attacker. Malleable encryption on the face of it is, is a bad thing, right? Um, I'm going to go through some examples of malleable encryption, um, and, and you can imagine why an attacker might want to do it. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a something called a one-time pad. Yes, that's, this is where you have a set of supposedly random things that you can then XOR or whatever with a, with a message. Is that right? That's exactly right. So you, you have a bit string that is the same length as the data that you want to encrypt. And the other person on the other side is aware of the same one-time pad and they will use it as well and they will get the original message out. And sometimes this is described as being the perfect encryption. But the problem is that it's malleable. So let's say that you, every day, the first thing you do when you go into the office is you're logging into a particular website and you're entering um, your password. It may use something called a, a stream cipher. Um, and a stream cipher um, uses a, a pseudo-random bit string um, for one-time pad. So we have a key, you and I, that we agree on beforehand. It's symmetric encryption, so it's the same key for both of us. Um, let's call it key K. And it goes into a box. Now there's also something called an initialization vector that's not very important right now. Um, but what it does is it outputs a bit string, let's call it B, and it will look something like uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. It's a random bit string, etc. Now we have the plain text, which is also a bit string, uh, which in this case was the website that you visit that morning. Uh, so let's say that it's 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? Now we uh, take this bit string and we pretend that it is actually random. There's no issues now with with doing that. Uh, there can be issues, other attacks that are based on the fact that it's not actually random, uh, but for now let's assume that it's actually random. Um, and what we do is we XOR all the bits one by one. Zero and one is one. One and one is zero. One and zero is one. Zero and one is one. One and one again is zero. And we keep doing that for the entire string. Now you get your website, you enter your password, and on the website there will be a field somewhere that tells you where the data is sent, right? You're sending your password to a particular location, uh, but I'm the attacker and I want the, your password. So if I can change that value, the location where you're sending it, which is just a part of the web page, I win. So let's say that you want to send it to your bank. Um, who are you banking with? Uh, Santander. Santander. Well, I created a fake website called Salamander. And if I can get you to submit your password to Salamander instead of Santander, mm -hmm. I win, right? So then I know what the website should look like and somewhere in there, there will be like a form with a submit field. So let's say that it's just two bits different, right? I, I was cheeky, I just made sure that it was two bits different. All I need to do is flip those two bits. I know what the web page looks like and I know what the location of that bit is. If I can intercept the cipher text, so this is the plain text, M, this is the bit string that we use to encrypt, and this is the resulting cipher text. Now, let's say that it is this bit that I want to alter in the message, and I want to change it from a one to a zero, right? If I flip this bit to a zero, and I send it to you, you will then take the cipher text, which is the altered cipher text, which is one, zero, one, zero, zero, right? This one has been changed into a zero. So let's call that C prime, the change ciphertext. And you will take the bit string you computed, which is zero, one, one, zero, one. I can't change that because I don't know the key and I don't know the initialization vector. So that remains the same. But when you XOR these two things, you will get the changed message, the modified message, which will be one, one, zero, uh, zero, one. And as you can see, the resulting message M prime differs in exactly the bit that we have swapped in the ciphertext. So flipping that ciphertext bit actually flips the message the bit. Message bit. Okay. Um, so if I know the location, I can change it. Now the beauty here is that the attacker at no point 
is able to decrypt any of the messages, right? He's not, he doesn't crack the system in that sense, um, but he was still able to break the system, you know, in, a, in the human sense. Um, of course, if I was wrong and that morning you loaded up a totally different page, then my attack is completely useless and I don't even know that my attack failed, right? Uh, other than the fact that you're now not sending your password to my salam and there. Um, so that's one example of malleable encryption and you can see here that this, you know, this is bad. In a future video, I will actually have a use case based on stream ciphers where exactly the same property is actually a good thing. Now, Stream ciphers are malleable, uh, but more famously, um, there is a class of malleable encryption where it's actually really, really useful. So again, the attacker can still use it to exploit, um, but you can also build more advanced protocols on the basis of it. Uh, that's known as homomorphic encryption. RSA is one example of homomorphic encryption. I'm not going to explain the basics of RSA again. I invite you to watch that video. In short, it's asymmetric encryption, which means that there's a different key for encrypting as there is for decrypting. Now, we typically call the public key E and the private key D, and there's also a modulus N, which everyone knows, just like the public key. Now, if I want to uh, encrypt a message, I can take M, to the power E, and then the person that owns a private key D, they have the ability of decrypting it by simply taking the ciphertext that they received. So let's call it C is M to the E. So they take C and they raise it to the power D. So they get M to the power E to the power D, which is equal to M to the power E D. And then, and this was the special magic property of RSA. This is equivalent to M mod N. So in other words, if you send me m to the power e, this is actually also modulo n. Uh, if you send me m to the power e mod n, and I take that value and I raise it to the power d, I get the original value back, and I'm the only person in the whole world who knows d, so I'm the only one who can decrypt it. Now, RSA is, is malleable. Um, so let's say that you're trying to send me a particular value. Um, for example, you're bidding on an object that you want to buy, right? Um, and you're bidding, let's say, 13 pounds. Now, what a malicious user might want to do is they say, I'm desperate to win this auction. So I'm going to take whatever value was sent in and I'm going to double it. Um, so they cannot decrypt the value, just like they couldn't decrypt the stream cipher, but they can still double it without knowing what they're doing. And this is what they need to do, right? You're sending me the number 13 to the power E mod n. You want to send in 26 to the power e. So you need to multiply this by 2 to the power e. e being a public value, so you can just compute to the, to the power e. And of course, this is equal to 26 to the power e. And if I raise the value that you send in to the power d, what I get is 26. Right, so you were able to modify the bit by multiplying it with a specific value. In this case, this was bad because it allowed someone to cheat, right? So attackers can use malleability, uh, but it actually can also be very useful. So in this case, um, what an attacker, but not just attackers actually, anyone is able to do is to multiply two ciphertexts together, right? Um, so we had the ciphertext 13 and we had the ciphertext 2, and we were able to multiply these to get 26. So if I multiply ciphertexts, I'm also multiplying the plaintext. And this is known as a homomorphic property. Uh, that's where the name comes from. It's a fancy mathematical name. Um, but what it means is if I do an operation in one world, the plaintext world, I'm doing another operation in the ciphertext world. Now in this case, the operations are the same. I'm multiplying and I'm multiplying. Uh, there's also crypto systems where if you multiply two ciphertexts, um, the result is actually the addition of the plaintexts. Uh, there's also a world where it's doing an XOR on the plaintext. Um, and most of the sort of simple homomorphic schemes only have one operation that they support. In this case, it's multiplication. And in some other cases, it's addition. Those are the typical ones. Um, 
There is also fully homomorphic encryption, which I'm not going to go into details with. That's really computationally expensive, but it can do addition and multiplication, or and and or, for example. So what can we use this for? We've got multiplicative homomorphic encryption. We can multiply ciphertexts. Now, I would like to convince you that multiplication and addition are actually kind of the same. So if I have a ciphertext, some random number, let's call it G, and I raise it to a power of a chosen number, give me a number. 42. 42. And I multiply that with G to the power of yet another number. 12. 12. If I multiply these two numbers together, what I get is G to the power 42 plus 12, 54. Now, that means that we can translate multiplication into addition. Now, a little bit of a warning here, uh, because if you're trying to figure out uh, g to the power x for a general value of x, that's computationally hard. That's the whole basis of, uh, of encryption here, right? Um, we cannot reverse engineer uh, the logarithm of any number. But if the base is very, very small, 54 for a computer is very small, what I can do is I can compute the first 100 exponents of g, g to the power 0, g to the power 1, I just compute them all, and I have a table of all the values, and now you give me g to the power 54, I can look it up and I know, ah, so the number is 54, right? So I never did a logarithm, I just tried all of them. Let's say that we have a little election, there's, let's say, 100 people, and they either vote yes or they vote no. Now, what we want to do is we want to be able to tally up the votes at the very end, and I don't want anyone to be able to see any individual vote. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that uh, we make the following agreement. There's two possible messages. Um, either you vote yes, in which case you take the message g to the power 1, or you vote no and you send g to the power 0. Now I'm going to use RSA here for homomorphic encryption and viewers that are paying attention might notice a problem with me doing so. Uh, this scheme doesn't actually work with RSA, so the homomorphic bit, which I'm about to explain, does work, but it's not secure. Um, see if you can figure out why it's not secure. Um, and I'll get back to it at the end. So you've got 100 people voting, so all of them agree to encrypt their value, so they take uh, either g to the power 1 to the power e, encrypted, or they take g to the power 0 to the power e. What you can do is you can take all 100 votes and you multiply them with each other, right? So we get a big computation like this. g to the power 0 to the power e times g to the power 1 to the power e times, let's say, another yes vote, g to the power 1 to the power e, etc. Now you can just do this multiplication, and what you will end up with is g to the power, however many people voted yes, let's say 61 people voted yes, to the power e. And now a central authority who knows the key d can take that number and raise it to the dth power, which is decrypting it, and what they will see is g to the power 61, which they will look up in their table, and they will recognize this corresponds to 61 yes votes. And that's, I would say, the, the, a killer example of what homomorphic encryption can do. It gets a lot more complicated if you want to do real voting schemes where you've got multiple candidates and things like that. Um, but there are homomorphic schemes that have been designed for, for more complicated elections, yes. To get back to the original thing I said, um, it doesn't actually work for RSA. Not because what I just showed you is not true, because it is, it, it works, it's functional, but it's not uh, confidential. Because if you vote zero, anyone can recognize g to the power zero to the power e. It will always be the same value. There's only two possible values that you could be sending, g to the power zero to the power e, or g to the power one to the power e. I will quickly learn both values, and I can tell who you voted by looking at that value. Um, this is known as deterministic encryption. Um, there's other schemes that are homomorphic that are not deterministic. The most famous one is Algamal. Um, if you just use Algamal instead of RSA, 
um, the protocol would be fixed for this problem. Uh, another example is the Pallier crypto system, uh, which would make your life even easier because their multiplying is adding and you don't need to use a trick with the logarithm. And they both want to attack this city here. And they know if they attack together, they win. If only one of them attacks and the other one hasn't got a message, they lose. They're free to send messages, but then...